When Patroclus led the Achaean army into battle against the Trojans to save the ships from being captured and destroyed, it was Achilles' armor he wore, so the Iliad tells us. Achilles had quit the battlefield in a peak of anger, and so he lent his friend and shield mate the beautiful helmet, shield, and greaves he had carried with him in order to make it seem as if he was still leading the fight, a ruse that had the desired effect of inspiring the Myrmidons to push back the Trojans. Not just from the beaches near the triremes, but all the way to the very walls of Troy itself. So it was that Hector, great hero of the men of Troy, came forth from the gate of the city to confront the man he thought was Achilles and to defeat him in battle. As the shield mate was not the demigod, Hector killed him with a spear to the stomach, and then, as was befitting the victor of man-to-man -man combat, stripped the body of the armor as spoils of victory. When Achilles learned of his friend's death, he was moved to great remorse and anger, and so committed himself to return to the battlefield in order to find and defeat Hector and so avenge Patroclus. However, always hot-headed and impulsive, it seemed that the allegedly indestructible warrior would put that claim to the test by going into battle without the benefit of any armor. So it was that his mother, the nymph Tethys, sought out the smith of Olympus, Hephaestus, to fashion replacements for her son. In response to her pleas, the forger of Zeus's lightning crafted a shield remarkable for its imagery that the poet describes as follows, taken from the translation by Robert Lattimore. First of all, he forged a shield that was huge and heavy, elaborating it about, and threw around it a shining triple rim that glittered, and the shield strap was cast of silver. There were five folds composing the shield itself, and upon it he elaborated many things in his skill and craftsmanship. He made the earth upon it and the sky, and the sea's water, and the tireless sun and the moon waxing into her fullness, and on it all the constellations that festoon the heavens, the Pleiades and the Hyades, and the strength of Orion and the bear, whom men give also the name of the wagon, who turns about in a fixed place and looks at Orion, and she alone is never plunged in the wash of the ocean. On it he wrought in all of their beauty two cities of mortal men, and there were marriages in one and festivals. They were leading the brides along the city from their maiden chambers under the flaring of torches, and the loud bride song was arising. The young men followed the circles of the dance, and among them the flutes and lyres kept up their clamor, as in the meantime the women standing each at the door of her court admired them. The people were assembled in the marketplace, where a quarrel had arisen, and two men were disputing over the blood price for a man who had been killed. One man promised full restitution in a public statement, but the other refused and would accept nothing. Both then made for an arbitrator to have a decision, and people were speaking up on either side to help both men. But the heralds kept the people in hand, as meanwhile the elders were in session on the benches of polished stone in the sacred circle and held in their hand the staves of the heralds who lift their voices." The two men rushed before these and took turns speaking their cases, and between them lay on the ground two talents of gold to be given to that judge who in this case spoke the straightest opinion. But around the other city were lying two forces of armed men shining in their war gear. For one side, counsel was divided whether to storm and sack or share between both sides the property and all the possessions the lovely citadel held within it. But the city's people were not giving away, and armed for an ambush. Their beloved wives and little children stood on the rampart to hold it, and with them the men with age upon them. But meanwhile the others went out, and Ares led them, and Pallas Athene. These 
were gold both, and golden raiment upon them, and they were beautiful and huge in their armor, being divinities, and conspicuous from afar, but the people around them were smaller. These, when they were come to the place that was set for their ambush in a river, where there was a watering place for all animals, there they sat down in place, surrounding themselves in bright bronze. But apart from these were sitting two men to watch for the rest of them and waiting until they could see the sheep and the shambling cattle who appeared presently, and two herdsmen went along with them playing happily on pipes and took no thought of the treachery. Those others saw them and made a rush and quickly thereafter cut off both sides of the herds of cattle and the beautiful flocks of shining sheep and killed the shepherds upon them. But the other army, as soon as they heard the uproar rising from the cattle, as they sat in their councils, suddenly mounted behind their light-foot horses and went after and soon overtook them. These stood their ground and fought a battle by the banks of the river, and they were making casts at each other with their spears, bronze-headed, and hate was there with confusion among them and death the destructive. She was holding a live man with a new wound and another one unhurt, and dragged the dead man by the feet through the carnage. The clothing upon her shoulders showed strong red with the men's blood. All closed together like living men, and fought with each other, and dragged away from each other the corpses of those who had fallen. He made upon it the shield, a soft field, the pride of the tilled land, wide and triple plowed, with many plowmen upon it who wheeled their teams at the turn and drove them in either direction. And as these, making their turn, would reach the end strip of the field, a man would come up to them at this point and hand them a flagon of honey-sweet wine, and they would turn again to the furrows in their haste to come again to the end strip of the deep field. The earth darkened behind them and looked like earth that had been plowed though it was gold. Such was the wonder of the shield's forging. He made upon it the precinct of a king, where the laborers were reaping, with the sharp reaping hooks in their hands. Of the cut swaths, some fell along the lines of reaping, one after another, while the sheaf binders caught up others and tied them with the bind ropes. There were three sheaf binders who stood by, and behind them were chick children, picking up the cut swaths and filling their arms with them and carried and gave them always. And by them the king in silence and holding his staff stood near the line of the reapers happily. And apart and under a tree the heralds made a feast ready and trimmed a great ox they had slaughtered. Meanwhile the women cattered for the workmen to eat abundant white barley. He made upon it a great vineyard, heavy with clusters, lovely and in gold. But the grapes upon it were darkened, and the vines themselves stood out through poles of silver. About them he made a field, ditch of dark metal, and drove all around this offense of tin. And there was only one path to the vineyard, and along it ran the grape bearers for the vineyard stripping. Young girls and young men, all in their light-hearted innocence, carried the kind sweet fruit away in their woven baskets, and in their midst a youth with a singing lyre played charmingly upon it for them, and sang the beautiful song for Linos in a light voice. And they followed him, and with singing and whistling and light dance steps of their feet kept time to the music. He made upon it a herd of horned straight oxen, the cattle were wrought of gold and of tin, and thronged in speed, and with lowing out of the dung of the farmyard to a pasturing place by a surrounding river, and beside the moving field of a reed bed. The herdsmen were of gold who went along with the cattle, four of them, and nine dogs shifting their feet followed them. But among the foremost of the cattle, two formidable lions had caught hold of a bellowing bull. And he, with loud lowings, was dragged away as the dogs and the young men went in pursuit of him. But the two lions, breaking open the hide of the great ox, gulped the black blood in the inward guts, as meanwhile the herdsmen were in the act of setting and urging the quick dogs upon them. 
but they, before they could get their teeth in, turned back from the lions, but would come and take their stand very close, and bayed, and kept clear. And the renowned smith of the strong arms made on it a meadow, large, and in a lovely valley for the glimmering sheep flocks, with dwelling places upon it, and covered shelters and sheepfolds. And the renowned smith of the strong arms made elaborate on it a dancing floor, like that which once, in the wide spaces of Konos, Daedalus built for Ariadne of the lovely tresses. And there were young men on it and young girls, sought for their beauty with gifts of oxen, dancing and holding hands at the wrist. These wore the maidens' long light robes, but the men wore tunics of fine-spun work and shining softly, touched with olive oil. And the girls wore fair garlands on their heads, while the young men carried golden knives that hung from sword belts of silver. At whiles, on their understanding feet, they would run very lightly, as when a potter, crouching, makes trial of his wheel, holding it close in his hands to see if it will run smooth. At another time they would form rows and run, rows crossing each other, and around the lovely chorus of dancers stood a great multitude happily watching, while among the dancers two acrobats led the measures of song and dance revolving around them. He made upon it the great strength of the ocean river, which ran around the outermost rim of the shield's strong structure. And so it was that Achilles returned to the field of battle, carrying with him not just a shield, but an entire view of the Greek cosmos, ready to vanquish the Trojans and avenge the death of the man he held so close to his heart. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 5, Finding Our Way. Episode 6, Ocean Around, a Wine-Darkened Sea. In these words of the Iliad, attributed to Homer, but likely based on an earlier oral tradition, are the bases of the claim by Strabo and others that the poet was, in fact, the founder of a new geographic science. In describing the shield, Homer gives the reader both a geographic and cosmographic view of the world in the Greek mind. As interpreted by Germain Ajac and the editors of the History of Cartography, quote, Despite the literary form of the poem, it gives us a clear picture of the various processes in the creation of this great work, with its manifestly cartographic symbolism. We are told how Hephaestus forged a huge shield, laminated with five layers of metal, and with a three-layered metal rim. The five plates that made up the shield consisted of a gold one in the middle, a tin one on each side of this, and finally two of bronze. On the front bronze plate, we are told that he fashioned his designs in a concentric pattern. The scenes of the earth and the heavens in the center, the two cities, one at peace, one at war, agricultural activity and pastoral life, and, quote, the ocean, that vast and mighty river, end quote, around the edge of the hard shield, denote his intention of presenting a synthesis of the inhabited world as an island surrounded by water. Hephaestus depicted the universe in miniature on Achilles' shield, and Homer, in his poetry, only provides a commentary on this pictorial representation." End quote. As we know, however, the Greeks were hardly original in this sort of a worldview. Like the Mesopotamians before them, the Greeks viewed the world as a disc-shaped thing 
centered on their culture and, like so many other elements of their science, such a view may well have been borrowed from those far more ancient cultures of the East. In the Greek mind, then, this picture of the entire world and the place of the Hellenes in it was known as the Oikomene, and unlike some cultures, it would, throughout the archaic and classical periods, be far more theoretical in nature than it would be practical. Put another way, it would be based a lot less on empirical observation and survey than it would be on considerations of geometry and symmetry. Now, before we go any further, I have to make the standard disclaimer, disclaimer I should say, one must always make when it comes to Greek philosophical considerations, natural or otherwise, through a period of time prior to the work of Plato. This uh, disclaimer is namely that we suffer from a nearly complete lack of primary source material. We don't have the works of the original writers, but rather fragmentary quotations of their ideas in the works of later authors, in the best case anyway, or, just as often, merely paraphrases and commentary that may or may not accurately, accurately represent what it is that those earlier authors really thought. That having been said, however, I do think that from these secondary sources, we can piece together a fairly accurate description of the broad brushstrokes of the ideas and models throughout the disparate Greek city-states and colonies as they were disseminated across the Mediterranean and into places like Asia, Asia Minor. One final note prior to working through the various contributors. It should be remembered that the various Greek natural philosophers were not working in a bubble, and as such, there would be continued influences from Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Phoenicia that would serve to drive the models and worldview the Greeks would develop over the course of several hundred years. As we begin our journey through the expanse of early Greek cartography and geography, we should say a few more words about Homer's great work and other contemporary artifacts such as the fresco at Thera. In these representations, one can see the presence of a feature of Greek philosophical thought that will be influential throughout Western culture down until the end of the medieval period and into the beginning of what has now been called by some the scientific revolution. And that is the connection between the macrocosmic and the microcosmic. Just as Hephaestus has included all of the elements and activities that make up the Greek world on this shield, so Achilles carries with him all of the Hellenistic oikomene into battle to defeat the Trojans. Similarly, the fresco discovered in what is known as the House of the Admiral in northern Crete shows a variety of human activities taking place in what can be considered to be a geographic context, marrying the aesthetic or decorative nature of the fresco with its descriptive elements to display the fundamental elements of geography, both physical and sociological, as a microcosm of the broader early Greek worldview. Of course, as we know, the early Greek civilizations that produced both the oral tradition that would go into the Iliad and the culture shown on the Thera fresco would run into trouble and fall into to the various forces that often spell the end of empire. However, as a new Greek civilization would arise around the Aegean Sea, many of the elements from that earlier time would survive, including the view that is known that the known and inhabited world could be represented in a circular fashion. According to tradition, the first of the 6th century Greeks to produce maps of the world was a student of Thales, an Aximander. Part of the Milesian school of philosophy that dominated so much of pre-Socratic Greek natural philosophy, Anaximander was considered by later scholars to be one of the founding geographers in the Greek tradition. Quoting again from the history of cartography, quote, In any case, according to Diogenes Laertius, the 3rd century AD compiler from whom we derive much of our biographical information about ancient Greek philosophers, Anaximander was the first to draw the outline of land and sea and also to have constructed a globe. Similarly, Agathermius, the author of a 3rd century geographical treatise and a source of many otherwise lost works, claims that Anaximander was the first to venture to draw the inhabited world on a map, or Panaki. And Strabo calls him the author who published the first geographical map. 
it is clear that Anaximander was the first recorded of that long line of Greek craftsmen philosophers who tried to express concepts in graphic form. End quote. What is actually less clear about Anaximander's work was his model of the earth. As the quote mentions, Diogenes Laertius thought that Anaximander was working with the spherical model of the earth, but there's a good bit of other evidence that the Milesian was given to representing the earth more as a cylinder than as a sphere. Whichever the case, what is clear is that Anaximander's thoughts represent a progression over the older disk or models of the earth that were found in earlier Greek and Mesopotamian cultures that had come far before him. Following this work were the contributions of one Hecateus, another Milesian who was also an accomplished historian and state, statesman. In what is thought to be one of his seminal works, named The Circuit of, of the Earth, or Peridos Geis, he divided the inhabited world into two parts one containing Europe, and the other Libya, or more broadly Africa, and Asia, meaning modern-day Turkey, the Middle East, and India. The map of the world in this work was thought by many Roman-era scholar, Roman scholars to be superior to not only that of Anaximander, but also those produced by later philosophers such as Hellenicus of Lesbos. What is important to note in all of these cases is that while successive maps likely incorporated greater and possibly more accurate geographical information, they all fit the general template of representing the known inhabited world in a circular fashion, with the land, however it might be divided up, as being surrounded by the great Oceanus. The materials at least some of these maps would have been made on transition from earlier hard-to-transport stone tablets or perishable papyrus to more durable and lightweight wooden panels or bronze tablets. Such would be the case when Aristagoras left Miletus for Greece in about 500 BCE in search of allies in the struggle against the Persian Empire. During this time, many of the maps would have been centered on Delphi, placing the oracle there at the center of the world, and would have been informed by distance measurements made up along the highways of the aforementioned Achaemenid Empire. At about this same time, when the city-states of Asia Minor were rebelling against the Persians and turning to Ionia for help in their quest of self-rule, there was a specific individual who was rebelling against the assumptions of the cartographers of his age. This person was the so-called father of history, Herodotus, who expressed great skepticism about the assumptions of the Milesians and the maps they produced. As he would write in his history, quote, For my part, I cannot help but laugh when I see numbers of persons drawing maps of the world without having any reason to guide them, making as they do the ocean stream to run all around the earth, and the earth itself to be an exact circle, as if described by a pair of compasses, with Europe and Asia just of the same size." End quote. These criticisms would be echoed by later scholars, such as Aristotle in the 4th century BCE and the Stoic philosopher Geminicus, who wrote in the 1st century BCE. So what were the basis of Herodotus's objections? I think there are two sources of doubt about the maps being produced. The first was just a general lack of data out at the edges, so to speak. While the region around the Mediterranean had been well explored and, to some degree, measured by 500 BCE, the same cannot be said of some of the other regions that were often found on these maps. Certainly the various civilizations of Mesopotamia, most notably the aforementioned Achaemenid Empire, had extended the boundaries of the known world across Arabia into the Indus River region, and the Egyptians had circumnavigated the African continent with the help of Phoenician sailors and navigators. But there was a good deal of uncertainty both east of India and north into Europe and into the Eurasian steppe. This lack of data led to the second source of Herodotus' skepticism, which was, if we don't know what's beyond what we're familiar with, 
Why are we assuming there's water at all, much less that it would literally encircle the entire land? And this leads to maybe a bit of um, philosophical speculation about the, the, the nature of human curiosity. And that's an interesting tendency in science, or perhaps more broadly, just in human thought, that when we're confronted with a situation where we don't know something, our tendency is to extrapolate about that thing from what we do know. In the case of nearly every exploration in the ancient world, what we had is we had a situation wherein the land that was crossed was then bounded by some sort of uncrossable water. Whether these were early explorations from navigators from Phoenicia, which found nothing but a possible vast expanse of sea beyond the Pillars of Hercules, or a hostile sea beyond the shores of southern Africa, it seemed that the world was encircled by ocean. Thus, when asked to explain what might be beyond the uncharted expanses of Europe, the steppes of the Scythians, or the jungles and mountains of India, the mindset was to assume that, like in the known cases, just beyond the horizon, one would find ocean. It's a result, I think, of the human mind's desire for a regular world that such a conclusion was reached. There is, however, another piece to this assumption and its rejection by Herodotus, at least in my opinion. In terms of Thomas Kuhn's model of scientific inquiry, what can we, we can actually see here in Herodotus's comments is the beginning of what will be a massive paradigm shift in what might be termed the quote-unquote Greek mind. Prior to around 500 BCE, the core intellectual accomplishment of what would become the classical Greek civilization was Homer's Iliad and the accompanying Odyssey. This world, founded in an ancient worldview, had as a fundamental assumption a disc-shaped world represented by that shield given to Achilles. As the classical Greek world began to take shape with the rise of the Ionian city-states and first modern-day Greek, Greece, I should say, and then as colonies of those city-states in places like Asia Minor, around the Black Sea, and in the boot of Italy, among other places, this fundamental picture of the world would be transported with those settlers. However, by that year of 500, evidence had begun to accumulate that such a model was inaccurate. We've already discussed Anaximander's move away from such a model, but probably more important was the work of the community that grew up around Pythagoras in southern Italy. It would be here in the work of men like Parmenides of Elea that a fully spherical model of the earth would be realized. While there is some debate about the origin of this picture, as you know, of the earth as a sphere, many modern scholars suggest that one of the major contributing factors was the picture of the heavens as a sphere upon which the star rested. Add to this the idea among the Pythagorean community that the, the shape of a sphere was the highest realization of geometric progression, and one can see the elements for a spherical model of the earth. Once such a picture was plausible, it was a simple step to begin to find empirical evidence that would support it. Since we've discussed this evidence in our episode titled Rounding the Earth, I won't go into detail as to the primary four lines or arguments made by Aristotle here, but by the time of the transition from the classical Greek world to the Hellenistic period following Philip II of Macedon's conquest, it was broadly accepted by most Mediterranean natural philosophers that the earth was a sphere and that that was part of the structure of the heavens. Herodotus, then, can be said to have been riding on the cusp of this paradigm shift. And, as such, it is clear that if the basic model of the Earth is to be questioned, so too must a number of the assumptions that have gone into the accepted maps being produced at the time of his writing. Among these assumptions are the assignment of the sizes of the three regions, or, to use a more modern term, land masses, seen on the maps of Anaximander, Hecateus, and Hellenicus. As he would write, quote, I am astonished that men should ever have had divided Libya, Asia, and Europe as they have, for they are exceedingly unequal. Europe extends the entire length from the other two, and for breadth will not even, as I think, bear to be compared to them. End quote. 
From these comments and others that he makes in the history, it seems likely that if Herodotus had been pressed to draw a map, he might have produced something similar to the T.O. maps of the medieval period wherein the Mediterranean Sea and the Nile formed the cross piece and stem of the letter T respectively, with Europe or Eurasia across the top of the T, and Africa to the west of the stem, and the Middle East and India to the east. One, the one difference, of course, would be that the world would have, or that he would have omitted the surrounding O or ocean. Given his skepticism, however, it is perhaps not surprising that Herodotus does not give a world map in his history, preferring to describe things only locally. As such, while he has much to say about geography in his history, the venerable father of that discipline is not considered by later writers such as Strabo to be a geographer. What is clear is that Herodotus didn't have much use for the theoretical or geometrical justifications and bases for the geography being done by many Greek philosophers, preferring instead that such considerations be rooted in empirical observation and direct measurement, as is befitting of a man who wrote about real places where armies marched and fought and men lived and died. While Herodotus was not considered to be a geographer, such cannot be said about his late contemporary Democritus, who lived from roughly 460 to 730 BCE. Known more so nowadays for his writings on atomic theory, the polymath Thracian natural philosopher actually wrote a great deal about geography in his works titled Uranography, Geography, and Polography that are, unfortunately, by and large lost to us today. Considered by Strabo to be one of the four most important geographers prior to Eratosthenes, Democritus' most important contribution, at least as far as we can reconstruct from references by later writers, was to produce a map of the world that was, rather than being circular in its representation, stretched or elongated along the east-west axis by about 50%. So influential was this map that its dimensions were generally accepted more than 150 years after its productions. Democritus's younger contemporary and student of Socrates, Plato wrote only tangentially about geography and cartography. In both the Republic and the Phaedo, the founder of the Academy in Athens speaks of a clearly spherical earth, with one passage going, quote, First of all, the true earth if one views it from above, is said to look like one of those 12-piece leather balls, variegated, a patchwork of colors, of which our colors here are, as it were, samples that painters use. There, the whole earth is of such colors, indeed of colors far brighter still and purer than these. One portion is purple, marvelous for its beauty, another is golden, and all that is white is whiter than chalk or snow, and the earth is composed of other colors likewise, indeed of colors more numerous and beautiful than any we have ever seen. Even its very hollows, full as they are of water and air, give an appearance of color, gleaming among the variety of the other colors, so that its general appearance is of one continuous multicolored surface." End quote. Those familiar with the recollections of early space travel from the astronauts of the Gemini and Apollo missions will find Plato's speculations regarding what the Earth might look like when viewed from a vantage point away from its surface, surface remarkably prophetic. Here again, this description is founded in theoretical thought. Plato was, in his natural philosophy, profoundly influenced by the Pythagoreans, and so it was that his explanation of why the Earth was a sphere had to do with its place in a larger spherically constructed cosmos. If it seems that the Greeks were merely geometrical or theoretical geographers during the classical period, we should temper that perception just a bit. There are a few artifacts that show that while philosophical writers of Asia Minor and Athens may have been more concerned with the quote-unquote big picture world maps and ideas, there were those who saw geography as a practical endeavor with very tangible real-world impl implications. 
The playwright Aristophanes, for example, in his play The Clouds, has a conversation between an old farmer named Strepsades, who has been forced by war to take up residence in Athens, and a young philosophy student regarding a map of the world among the various implements of the school of philosophy. As a part of the dialogue, the old farmer who has fought in many of the battles of the Peloponnese and thus is familiar with the distances between the various cities takes the students to task for a world map showing Sparta to be much closer to Athens than he knows it to be. What we can see here is that in Aristophanes' play, the playwright can assume that his audience truly understands what maps look like would have had experience with them, and would have understood how they would have been used in an everyday world. Additionally, there are a few examples of what might be thought of as plan maps for local sites. These include an engraving diagram for the pathways to or into a mine in Therikos and Attica, and what might be thought of as ancient drawings for a Temple of Apollo at Didyma in Asia Minor that employ the method of scale as one might see in modern blueprints. While such examples are relatively rare, it is likely that this is due to the generally ephemeral nature of such tools that are discarded or covered over once their usefulness has come to an end. The work of Plato was shortly thereafter extended by a mathematician who attended classes at Plato's school but was never officially a student there, as far as we know. Eudoxus of Sidnus was, like many who worked in geography, something of a polymath who studied not only with Plato, but also in Egypt with the priests at Helopolis, who were in the process of developing and using an intricate method of using various constellations and stars to align the various temples and holy sites so important to the practice of their religious, religious observances. Eudoxus would take these various influences and fuse them into a profoundly powerful model that attempted to explain the motions of the planets in a geocentric cosmos. While we discussed this in our episodes on Greek astronomy, one important part of this was the development of not only the most advanced model of a spherical Earth, one that Aristotle would later draw upon, but also the first really good map of what is known as the celestial sphere, a representation of the stars affixed to a rotating sphere as seen from the outside in. This representation is thought to be the inspiration and source of the constellations shown on the globe held on Atlas's shoulder in what is known as the Farnese Atlas, which is preserved in Naples. While the statue is almost certainly a copy made in the 2nd century CE, it seems clear that it has carefully preserved features of an earlier Hellenistic original that incorporated Eudoxus's celestial sphere. We know this because of the positioning of the various constellations with respect to the celestial North Pole and the detailing the various animals and figures on the globe, which can be seen to be taken from a poem by the writer Erastus, who took Eudoxus's writings and put them into verse to make them more accessible. Contemporary with this theoretical work of Eudoxus was that of a historian by the name of Ephorus. His most notable contribution to our examination was the making of a map for a book that discussed the various peoples known to inhabit the world. While we don't have that map, later writers like Strabo note that this map is important because it continues the trend of stretching the known world horizontally, thus moving further away from a circular world to one where the land is pulled around the globe. Christian writers in the 6th century AD would show Euphorus' map as being rectangular, with south oriented at the top of the map and north at the bottom, with the whole thing being centered on Greece. The final figure to discuss, as we conclude our examination of the period of classical Greek geography, is, of course, as always, Aristotle. By 350 BCE, Aristotle is able to not only clearly state that the Earth is a sphere, but to offer at least four lines of empirically based reasoning to support his view. As part of this discussion, he brought forward an idea first offered by the Pythagorean Parmenides. This was the dividing of the world into five climatic zones. The middle one was thought to be hot and uninhabitable. Think, if you will, sort of an equatorial region. North and south of this were bands of temperate and habitable climate. Finally, near the top and bottom of the sphere were icy regions that were again thought to be uninhabitable. 
polar regions, if you care to think of it that way. Aristotle claimed that the known peoples of the world lived in the northern temperate zone, from the pillars to India, east to west, and from Ethiopia to the Sea of Azov, or Palace Maotis, as he would have known it, from south to north. Looking for peoples outside this region were, was foolish, he said, because going further north or south would take the explorer into uninhabitable regions, while going further east and west would lead to unending notions. Why did he think this? Well, it has to do with another part of his model of the cosmos. This other idea Aristotle advanced is something we discussed briefly in our sort of development of the scientific revolution trilogy that we did a while back. Aristotle adopted the Platonic or Eudoxian idea of the universe being made up of a series of concentric spheres. To this he added the supposition that there were two realms, a terrestrial realm made of the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire, and a celestial realm made of a fifth element, alternatively called ether or quintessence by various later commentators. Now, just like the celestial realm was made up of nested spheres, so too did he believe that the terrestrial realm should be made up of concentric spheres of the four elements arranged by density. Thus, the center sphere should be earth, with the sphere of water on top of that, air above the water, and then fire surrounding that before the reaching of the sphere of the moon and the fully celestial realm. The problem with this, of course, was that if this were strictly true, there should be no land above the water. Now Aristotle resolved this by saying that the sphere of earth floated to the top of the sphere of the water a bit like an apple in a barrel of water at a fall country fair. Why this might occur is a bit of a mystery given the density argument, but the inhabited world and the lo known land masses were the portion of the sphere of the earth that poked above the water, as it were, like some giant island. The upshot of this, of course, is that according to Aristotle, there should be no significant land away from the world as the Greeks knew it. This, of course, would make the discovery of first America and later Australia almost literally earth-shattering to the minds of the Europeans emerging out of the medieval period into the so-called modern period that lacked a unified Christianity or even the vestiges of a Roman Empire, but possessed the new technology for disseminating information cheaply and easily. But that's a story for later. So what are we to make of the contributions of the classical Greeks? What seems clear is that for the peoples that surrounded the Mediterranean Sea, the Greeks took the earth from something that could be represented on a hero's shield to a sphere that was part of a fully integrated cosmos. In this shift, it was mathematics, namely geometry, and theoretical considerations that took the central role, at least initially. However, by the end of this period, the shifting political winds that would result in a Greek empire and the spread of Greek ideas across the various territories and former empires of Persia, Egypt, and Phoenicia would also cause a significant shift in how geography would be done. With this synthesis would come a rising interest in using empirical data to refine those geometrical models. <music> Let me wrap up this episode by once again saying thanks to everyone for taking the time to tune in. I know that there are a lot of different ways you could use your time with the number of really good podcasts out there that's always expanding. As I'm releasing this on International Podcast Day of 2019, let me give a shout out to all of the great independent history, philosophy, and science podcasters who give their time and energy to fill the world with the knowledge that they've acquired. Let me also extend to you the thanks Stephen West of the Excellent Philosophize this podcast uses at the end of each of his episodes. Thank you for wanting to know more today than you did yesterday. It's truly an honor to be a part of this community of both podcast producers and podcast listeners. In that vein, if you're interested in knowing about more about educational podcasting, I would urge you to check out the Sound Education Conference, which will be taking place from Wednesday, October 9th to Saturday the 12th. 
a whole host of educational podcasters will descend on Boston, Massachusetts to talk shop and get ideas on how to make better content. And if that's something you think you'd be interested in, I really highly encourage it. As I know a number of you probably are really busy, I would say that if you only have one day, I would suggest checking out Saturday with the Mike Duncan keynote kicking things off in the morning and then the really fantastic festival of ideas going through the day. Hearing the festival contributions last year was like being in an extended set of TED Talks by some of the best independent podcasters out there. My only wish is that I could join this year's festivities, but unfortunately, work responsibilities will keep me on the Colorado Plateau this year. I also want to offer my thanks to the folks at the Blue Dot Sessions, whose music is the palette that we paint this podcast with. And to my Jewish listeners in this time of Rosh Hashanah, may the Lord inscribe your name in the Book of Life for a good year. La Shana Tava. If you're interested in more information about the episodes we release, you can head over to our podcast website, thescientificodyssey.typepad.com, or join our Facebook group by searching on the show's title. You can follow me on Twitter, at Chad Davies, on Instagram, at Odyssey Navigator, or you can email me at cldavies at mac.com. Next week, we'll continue our exploration of geography and cartography into the Hellenistic period and beyond. Until then, full sails on your journey. <laughs>